When we think of Cupid, the image that often comes to mind is a cute, chubby baby with a bow and arrow, charmingly mischievous as he plays matchmaker. But this playful image hides a deeper, more complex story. Who really is Cupid, the famed god of love? Why does he carry a weapon typically used in warfare? And what else did his arrows inflict as well as love? In this video, we'll delve into the enchanting and sometimes bewildering myths of Cupid. Welcome to the Mysteries of Mythology, Cupid. Like nearly all figures in Roman mythology, Cupid also had an equivalent predecessor in Greek mythology. This was the god Eros. What's unique about Eros is that it seems that he had two births. In the Greek creation myth, Eros was the earliest of the primordial gods to appear from chaos. Although he wasn't directly involved in the act, it was his embodiment of love and reproduction that allowed Gaia, the earth deity, to create and give birth to all the elements of the world that we know, as well as the many children that followed. The primordial Eros was the greatest force of all, for without him, the other creations would have remained empty and sterile. The primordial Eros represented the fundamental cosmic force of love and desire, a power that bound the universe together. It was this version of Eros who blessed the union of Gaia and the primordial god of the sky, Uranus, who went on to give birth to the Titans, including the parents of the gods of Olympus. In fact, the word erogenous comes from Eros's name, Eros meaning love and genus meaning producing. But this was to be the last we would hear of the primordial Eros. Unlike his God-bearing brothers and sisters, Gaia, Tartarus, Nyx and Erebus, the primordial version was never mentioned again. The next time we hear of Eros is in his birth or rebirth to his mother Aphrodite, goddess of love, beauty, pleasure, and procreation. This version of Eros is now more specifically the embodiment of love and sexual desire. It is this version of Eros that is more similar to the Cupid of Rome and the character found in your local card shop. The father of the godly version of Eros is unclear in earlier versions, it's thought to be one of three of the Olympian gods, Zeus, Hermes, or Ares. The most popular option is Ares, symbolizing him being born from love and war. It could also explain perhaps why the instrument he uses to spread love is a weapon of war, the bow and arrow. In Roman mythology, it's agreed that the father of Eros, or Cupid, was Mars, who is the equivalent of Ares. It's a little known fact that it wasn't just love that was shared when Cupid's arrow struck you. This only happens with one of the gold-tipped arrows. Cupid's quiver also held arrows tipped with lead. A strike from one of these arrows could lead to indifference towards someone or even hate. As most of us probably know, the gods were fickle. So when Apollo had teased Eros, saying that Eros fumbled with his bow and arrow like a child, Eros shot him with a gold-tipped arrow, causing him to fall desperately in love with the nymph Daphne, whose name means laurel in Greek. But Eros also shot Daphne with a lead-tipped arrow, causing her to be repulsed by Apollo. What followed was a string of advances from Apollo and an equal number of rejections from Daphne. Unable to get away from Apollo, Daphne prayed to her father, Peneus, a river god, for help. Heeding her plea, he transformed her into a bay laurel tree. The laurel tree became sacred to Apollo, often associated with him thereafter. Before the Renaissance artists depicted Eros or Cupid as a chubby child with small wings, he was known as one of the most beautiful gods with golden glowing hair, beautiful gold wings, and a body that could elicit lust on seeing him. This was a good-looking dude. 
This depiction as a child began to form with the emergence of the Roman Empire and was popularized by later Christian artists looking for a more modest version of the god of sex. Another little-known fact about Eros is that he is not alone in his domain over love. He is part of a group of divine beings known as the Erotes. These winged gods, often depicted as companions or attendants of Aphrodite, each represent different facets of love and desire. Among them is Anteros, sometimes seen as the brother or counterpart of Eros. Anteros is the embodiment of requited love, love that is returned to you. Anteros was considered almost identical to Eros, but sometimes held a club instead of a bow and arrow and had butterfly wings. Although many of the stories in Greek and Roman mythology talk about Eros's influence on the other gods, such as the many affairs and indiscretions of Zeus and his brothers, there are only a few that directly talks about him. Written by the Roman author and poet Apuleius, Cupid finds himself in a novel titled The Golden Ass. I'm not making it up. In this tale, we meet a beautiful mortal princess named Psyche. Her beauty was so renowned that people would visit the kingdom to chance a glance at her. This was harmless adoration. That was until people began to compare her beauty to Aphrodite or Venus, as the Romans called her. People began to tell stories saying that just as Venus was born from the foam of the sea, Psyche was born in a similar way, but from the earth. They offered gifts to her in the streets and praised her looks in ways that were only meant for the gods. Venus was not happy. Things took a turn for the worse when people who now worshipped Psyche for her beauty began to abandon the temples and altars of Venus. Venus was furious and wanted to make an example for all to see. She called for her son Cupid and instructed him to make Psyche fall in love with the most detestable and unworthy creature he could find. That night, Cupid crept into the bedchamber of Psyche and approached her with his arrow drawn. Stunned by her beauty, Cupid stumbled. In the commotion, the tip of his golden arrow pierced his skin, cementing his love for Psyche. Psyche awoke oblivious that Cupid had visited. Despite her beauty and constant adoration from passers-by, Psyche was unhappy. She was the youngest of three sisters. Her sisters had found suitors and married, yet no one had asked her for her hand in marriage. Her father, believing that she had somehow been cursed, visited the oracle at the Temple of Apollo for guidance. The oracle prophesied that Psyche would never marry a mortal man, but would marry an abominable winged beast. She told the king to take his daughter, dressed in funeral attire, to a nearby cliff where the beast would take her. Resigned to the prophecy, the king took his daughter as instructed to the cliff edge. At the summit of the cliff, a strong wind drew, and Psyche found herself being lifted and carried away by Zephyr, the west wind. She arrived in a grove, and the warm wind helped her to fall asleep. When she awoke, she was at the entrance of a great palace. As she entered, a soft voice from an unseen source told her to make herself at home. Psyche enjoyed a bath, followed by a feast, and realized that the voice belonged to her new husband. Her new husband explained that she could have everything she wished for, but could never know his true identity. Each night, her husband visited her in complete darkness, and over time, she grew to love him. But in the giant palace with no one but her husband to talk to, Psyche grew bored. She begged her husband to allow her sisters to visit, and unable to see his wife so distressed, he agreed. The same Zephyr wind that carried her brought her sisters to the gates of the palace. Seeing the grandeur of the palace, Psyche's sisters became immediately envious. Her sisters, consumed by jealousy, began to plant seeds of doubt in Psyche's mind. They reminded her of the oracle's prophecy about marrying a monstrous creature. They convinced her to ignore her husband's one request 
that he was indeed a hideous beast. They planted the fear that her life was in danger. Prepare a lantern and a sharp knife, they advised, and while he sleeps, illuminate his face. If he is the monster we suspect, end his life. That night, tormented by curiosity and fear, Psyche prepared a lantern and a knife. As her husband lay sleeping, she shone the light upon his face, revealing not a monster, but the incomparably beautiful Cupid. Startled by her discovery, she accidentally spilled oil from the lantern, awakening Cupid. Realizing that Psyche had broken her promise, Cupid fled, leaving Psyche alone and heartbroken. Meanwhile, Psyche's sisters, having sown the seeds of doubt and fear in their sister, sought to take her place. Believing Psyche's husband to be a divine being, each sister planned to win him for herself. They climbed the cliff from which Psyche had been taken, each hoping to be carried away by Zephyr to the palace. However, their attempts to replicate Psyche's journey led to their tragic demise as they plunged from the cliff, meeting a fatal end. Back at the palace, a distraught Psyche roamed the lands without food or water, seeking her lost love. She approached the temples of the gods, pleading for help. She even stopped at the temples of Hera and Demeter to ask for help. But the goddesses said that as much as they wished to, Aphrodite was after Psyche, and they couldn't betray her. Venus, furious at Psyche for harming her son, offered any soldier of Greece a reward if they had information on Psyche's location with seven kisses on the lips and one with tongue. Psyche finally surrendered herself to Venus at her temple. In a cruel plan, Venus told Psyche she would forgive her for what she had done if she was willing to complete a series of trials. Venus never intended to fulfill her promise. In the display of cunning cruelty, Venus gathered a mix of beans, lentils, and poppy seeds, along with barley, wheat, and millet seeds, and told Psyche that if she wanted to see Cupid, she needed to separate and organize each variety by nightfall. An observant ant, touched by Psyche's plight, rallied to her cause. With a sense of compassion, it summoned the entire colony from its anthill. Together, in a remarkable display of unity, the ants skillfully divided the grains. Having accomplished the impossible task, the ants disappeared as quietly as they had come. Venus was, of course, furious that Psyche had completed what she thought would be an impossible task. On the following day, Venus unveiled yet another challenge for Psyche. She was to cross a river and procure the Golden Fleece from a herd of fierce rams on the opposite bank. Overwhelmed by the perilous task, Psyche considered surrendering herself to the river's depths. However, the river itself, sensing her despair, whispered a counsel. It advised her to seek refuge and wait until the midday sun and gentle breeze soothed the rams into a state of tranquility. Heeding this advice, Psyche waited for the rams to calm and fall asleep. When the rams became docile, she cautiously approached and successfully gathered the golden fleece, unthreatened by their rage. Venus, relentless in her trials, commanded Psyche to gather the dark, forbidding waters from a river surrounded by falling rocks and deadly serpents. Such a feat seemed beyond the reach of any mortal, yet in this moment of dire need, Jupiter, or Zeus in Greek mythology, the supreme deity, looked upon Psyche with mercy. Moved by her plight, he dispatched an eagle, Jupiter's eagle fetched a jug and flew effortlessly to the river and retrieved the water for Psyche. Venus, still not appeased, presented Psyche with her final and most perilous task yet. This might be a good time to please the gods of mythology with a quick ritual. Hit that thumbs up, subscribe, and strike the bell for notifications. For her final task, Psyche was instructed to venture into the daunting depths of the underworld to retrieve a golden box. 
This mystical box held within it a fragment of Proserpine, the god of the underworld's unparalleled beauty. As Psyche embarked on this treacherous journey, she encountered a tower that served as a gateway to the underworld. The tower, almost as if sentient, imparted guidance on navigating the dark realm and locating Proserpine. She's told to pacify Cerberus, the three-headed dog, guarding the entrance with a honey cake, and to pay Charon, the ferryman, for a ride across the river Styx. The tower also warns her not to partake in any food or drink in the underworld, and to ignore the pleas of the dead. Following the tower's directions, Psyche found herself in the Grand Palace of the Underworld. Heeding the tower's counsel, she resisted the allure of comfortable seats and sumptuous feasts offered to her, choosing instead to sit on the floor and eat a crust of bread she brought with her. Upon delivering Venus's request to Proserpine, the queen of the underworld generously obliged infusing the golden box with her essence of beauty. With the mission seemingly complete, Psyche ascended from the underworld, the mysterious box in hand. However, curiosity, an ever-persistent force, gnawed at her. Eventually, it overwhelmed her restraint, leading her to peek inside the box. To her dismay, she found not beauty, but a dark, sedative cloud that enveloped her in a deep slumber. Meanwhile, Cupid, now recovered from his injury, yearned for Psyche with a love too strong to ignore. He found her sleeping in the underworld, swiftly closed the box, and awakened her. In an act of devotion, Cupid presented the box to Venus, fulfilling Psyche's task. Seeking to end their trials, Cupid appealed to Jupiter, requesting that he stop his mother's trials. Jupiter agreed on the condition that in the future Cupid would offer his assistance in matters of the heart and his loins. In the celestial assembly called by Jupiter, he instructed Venus to cease her torment of Psyche. Psyche was then presented with ambrosia, the nectar of immortality. Drinking this divine elixir, she transcended her mortal form, becoming the goddess of the soul. United at last in divine matrimony, Cupid and Psyche's love blossomed evermore. Together, they had a child named Voluptus, meaning pleasure. And as they say, they lived happily ever after. The story is full of symbolism and meaning, such as Aphrodite symbolizing an obsession with physical beauty and Psyche representing the soul and inner beauty, to the journey to the underworld representing the journey into the soul and the transformation that results from the journey. Cupid, or Eros, is more than his common image as a matchmaker. His myths offer insights into the human condition, touching on themes of love, desire, growth, and transformation. Through his tales, we see reflections of our own journeys, the trials of Psyche mirroring our own quests for self-discovery, and Cupid's playful yet impactful actions reminding us of love's pervasive power. What more can you add to this story? Share it in the comments below. If you want to continue your journey into the realm of mythology, watch one of the next videos.